Welcome with me this morning, Pastor Tani Berenje, and I immediately want to start with Mark chapter 16, verse 6, where he said to them, do not be alarmed. So they were afraid, and he said, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples. And Peter, that he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him, uh, as he said to you. So important to remember today the scriptures, he said, do not be alarmed. And when we get to the end of the word, we're going to look at where he says to them, but go. But first, let's look at Luke chapter 24, verse 5. He says, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they say to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? And this morning, I want to start off with that word. I want to start off with what they were looking for and what they were seeking for. Because the disciples were seeking and looking to find Jesus in the physical, looking for life in the physical. And that's why I said, why do you look for the living among the dead? And many of us, we are looking for a dead Jesus. When we talk about Jesus, we are talking about life. We are looking for life, but you are looking for dead life. You are looking for empty life. You are looking for a dead Jesus. So why do you seek for the living among the dead? And when you are looking for life in physical things, you see, those are the dead things. You cannot find eternal life among the temporary. You are looking for your life in stuff. You are looking for your life in money. You're looking for your life in the race. Looking for it among the dead, the temporary things. But you see, there is no life there. The life that we find is in Jesus Christ. And Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So here's the thing about things that are dead. They are only temporary. And now we come and, you know, because you get the money, and you use it, but then you need more. You take the drugs and you've got a momentarily relief, but then you need more. You get the pat on the back for the um, education and the certificate or the degree that you've got, but that's only for a moment. That's only a temporary moment. You want that same feeling again. You need to go study something new. So there isn't life there. And the getting of the praises of man in finding in the acceptance of man, there's no life there. Everything is temporary. And it's not only just temporary. But the second thing is you need more of the same to get that momentary satisfaction. So a certain amount of drugs satisfy you for a moment. But to get that same satisfaction, you need more and more and more. You know, we come and we say, well, if I can just get a job. Now you have the job. Now you say, well, if I can just get more money. Now you get the money and then that isn't enough as well. You know, so here's the thing. It doesn't matter how much money it is. It's never going to be enough because you always need more for that satisfaction, for that relief. And now you need to get into the next thing. And that's why it doesn't satisfy sex, drugs, validation, acceptance. You cannot find eternal value in the temporary. You are looking for a dead Jesus. You are trying to find the living among the dead. Well, if only, you know, if I, I just need to get a an husband. And then you get the husband. And now you say, well, I just need to get a child. And now you get the child. See, at the end of the day, you see, we've got to find that which has eternal value. And that's why Jesus answered in John chapter 4, verse 13. He answered and he said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give, he will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him becomes in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. In other words, when you partake of the life of Jesus, you don't just receive life. The Bible says you receive the fountain, so you become life to others. 
You become life to your spouse. You become life to your children. You become life to your neighborhood, to the people around you, to the nations you are dwelling in. You become the fountain of life. Isn't that incredible? And that's why this morning we are not celebrating a dead Jesus. He is not in the tomb. Hallelujah. He is alive. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, get out of the graveyard. Stop breaking or stop looking for the living among the dead, right? And some of you, it's within people that are around you that are dead. It is in the acquaintances that are around you that are dead. Some of you, it's your BFF, your best friend for life. You are trying to find the living, but it's dead. Are you hearing me here today? So what we need is Jesus within our lives because that is what happened here. So we, when we talk about resurrection, it means the dead coming alive. The dead now being made useful. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 8, 34, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. He is working. Jesus is not sleeping. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is not in the tomb. He is seated next to daddy. And when the devil comes and the uh, persecution comes and the, and the prosecutor comes. And now he comes and he says, mm, look at what he's done. But see then what happens when there's confession. We come before the Lord. There is, re re uh, 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 there is uh, repentance. And then uh, Jesus comes and he shows the father. And he says, you know, I gave, I paid the price you know, Father, and the sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. And he is making intercession for us. And that's why he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Mark 16 verse 6. Do not be alarmed. You see, the uh, Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, he is risen. He is not here. Do not be afraid. Why? Because Jesus is with us. He's with us today and every day. Matthew 28, 20 says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When we say Jesus is risen, we say he is among us today. He is with us. Hallelujah. So what happened on that day? See, the day that Jesus died was extremely significant because it is on that day that death was conquered. It is on that day that death lost its sting, that death lost its power. And that's why Hebrew chapter 2 verse 14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, this is Jesus, life was shed in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Yes, that is what Jesus came to do for us through fear of death. Now, if you have fear within your life, you are immobilized. You don't do anything. Anything we do then is just to maintain and we just want to pers persevere, right? But Jesus said, no, you can live life and you can live boldly because I paid the price. And you see, when Jesus went into Hades in, in 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, he says, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. In other words, he nullified death. Acts 2 verse 24 says, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. This is so powerful. Since it was impossible for him to be held in his power, it was impossible that death could not hold him. So just for a little bit of understanding, on that day that Jesus died, that's, uh, uh, I'm going to share what happened on that day. Because that's why we know for a fact that the devil cannot forecast. He cannot see the future. So stay away from people who forecast the future. And maybe you've gone and thrown the bones and done what you needed to do. But see, the devil cannot forecast the future. The devil cannot see the future because by killing Jesus, he actually gave up authority. Because the devil 
actually had it good because of Adam and Eve that sinned before God. And they actually gave the control of the earth to the devil because they were in charge, but they surrendered that. And therefore, legally speaking, the devil had the right over the earth and over its people. But you see, God made a plan, and we see that in Genesis chapter 3, when he made the clothes out of skin, and there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be blood that was flown, because we are speaking about the Lamb of God that died, that was slain for us. But you see, it's not just about the death. The power is in the resurrection. Hallelujah. And it is through death that Jesus had access through the gates of Hades. In other words, legally speaking, God did not have a right because he entrusted authority to man, to Adam and Eve, and then they gave it to the devil. So what happened? Jesus came and he lived the life, pure, holy, sinless. No, no making, not making uh, one sin, not making one mistake. He lived this life. Going through what you and I are experiencing, going through the same trials and the tribulations as man, yet without sin. He conquered sin. And then the devil thought, you know what? Here is God on the earth. Let me kill him. And then I am in control because he wanted to be God. And what happened is he miscalculated the power of righteousness. He miscalculated the power of love. He miscalculated the power of the goodness of God. And he miscalculated the accuracy and the holiness of God. So by murdering Jesus, he gave Jesus access. He thought he would bring Jesus into his domain because he was in control of death and any person who died was brought into that domain. And when Jesus died, he had entrance through the gates of Hades into the devil's path with all the sinners, with all the sin, with all the violent thoughts, with all the deception. But you see, when he entered into that place, the righteousness and the light of God lit up that place. You see, when he went into Hades, darkness could not comprehend the light. And going into that place, that place was lit up and everything was exposed. You could see everything. You could see every thought it's like the thoughts of every demon was on the big screen uh, like if you were there you know suddenly you could read what everyone was going to do to you how they're going to hurt you and destroy you and everything and that's why there was extreme fear because suddenly everything of everybody every demon and the devil himself because the bible says he's a liar he's the father of all lies so everything suddenly the devil was exposed you know, it is like picking up a rock and under the rock there's all these insects and all of a sudden they are running away trying to find a darkness to hide. And that is what happened when Jesus got in there. Suddenly it was light. And I think there was a squealing and a running away and a trying to hide and trying to cover. And the Bible says that the, Jesus took hold of the devil. And the Bible says he took hold, uh, he took the keys of the kingdom. And the key speaks about the right. The key speaks about authority. And he said, give me back my people. And he took back the keys of the kingdom. And the Bible says he made a public spectacle of him triumphing over him. He exposed the devil and showed the weakness of who he is. In Colossians 2 verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And that's why death could not hold him and that's why the word of god says in 1 corinthians 15 verse 54 death is swallowed up in victory isn't that beautiful death is swallowed up in victory and therefore we can say oh death where is your sting oh hades where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. If you receive Jesus within your life, that same Spirit will quicken your mortal body, the Bible says. If you have the resurrected Jesus saying on the inside, you have the ability to overcome. And now you get to that place in your life 
where you can live life boldly, where you can live your life like they did in Revelation 12 verse 11 and the overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. You know it says and they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony and it says this is the New Living Translation and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So if you're afraid to die, you will be afraid to live. So therefore, now we have little people, small people, living just for themselves, just trying to preserve themselves and their reputation, and always afraid of what people are going to think and what people are going to say. You see, you're still afraid to live. And you see, that's why you've got to live boldly in love. Why? Because death has lost its thing. I'm not afraid to die. Because the Bible teaches us once again when we talk about death, in Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And he says, for me to live is Christ. And then, see, we stop there, period. But he says, for me to live is Christ. And then he says, to die. Oh, no, don't go there. No, please go there. Because death is a reality. So to die is gain. You are going to be with the Lord. And therefore, we've got to live life boldly. We've got to live life to the fullest. Not trying to preserve our own little lives and ourselves, right? Like a vehicle, you buy the vehicle, but now the vehicle's in the garage. You maybe drive it once a year, got no passengers, and they drive it only once a year to preserve it. Well, here's the thing. The purpose of that car is never fulfilled. The reason that car was made. And therefore, now what happens is now maybe you maintain it and you look after it. But we know, but for instance, we've got a car that's 20 years old. And you see, this vehicle has given us everything. It's got more than 100, 200,000 kilometers. And it's changed the engine maybe once or twice. I don't know. But this car, now you come and you say, you know, this car has given me everything. It's been used. It's fulfilled in mandate. It's fulfilled its purpose. The reason why I bought it, we used this car. It gave me everything. Now that is the same with our lives. We try to preserve ourselves. And we try to look after ourselves. Instead of allowing God to use us. Instead of allowing God to renew our youth like the eagle. Where do we do maintenance? Through the word of God. This is why we go to church and we're sitting in the ministry today. Hearing the word of God to change the oil. To get clean oil. To get the oil of the Holy Spirit. That is why we pray. That is why we seek the Lord. We have maintenance taking place on the inside. God renewing our youth like the eagles. Why? So that we can become what God wants us to become. And so many people, there's so many people that are so old and they're only 25 years old. Oh, Pastor, I'm just trying to stay young. You know, the scalpel will not keep you young because you can be young on the outside and very old on the inside, complaining and murmuring and always being overwhelmed, you know. And, oh, I can't do this. And why is everyone using me? And I feel abused. Hallelujah. It's not how you look on the outside. It's whether you have maintained on the inside. And that's why when we have that attitude that what we do, you know, what God wants us to do, that that spirit comes then that raised Jesus from the dead. And now he dwells in you as you do that which God wants you to do. He quicken your mortal body. He will move you. And Romans 8 verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he, will raise Christ, uh, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. You. We looked at the Holy Spirit now for three weeks. He, he, you can build a relationship with the Holy Spirit as the di disciples did with Jesus. He dwells in you, abides in you as you read the word, as you grow, as you go to sell to church, as you do the word. You know, be a disciple, make disciples. His Spirit dwells in you. But see, now we come and we sing the song, Oh Lord, if you can use anything, use me. And then you come, Pastor, I want to be a leader. And then two, three months later, you said, Oh, no. I'm stopping this thing, you know. I can't do this anymore. Pastor, you know these people. They just use you, Pastor. You know, they, they really just use you. I'm sorry. Didn't you say, Lord, if you can use anything? 
Oh, you want to sit in the garage and look good. You see, that's what it means to love your neighbor. That's what it means. That's why Paul comes and he says in Philippians 2 verse 17, Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. He says, my whole life, I've poured out. I'm poured out like wine on the sacrifice. I, see, I want to get to the end of my life and having been used up. You know, I don't want to look good. I want to see the grace of God working through me, moving through my life, where I can come to the end and say, you know what? I gave everything um, to my family, to, 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 to the people in our ministry, to, to the community. I gave everything. I lived boldly. I didn't hold back. I didn't care what people were thinking. I didn't care what people said. And you know what? I know that sometimes if you go out there and you start doing something, you will get criticism. You will make mistakes. But now we come and we say, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. You know what? In case, what do you mean what in case? Get out there, preach the gospel, teach people's, uh, touch people's lives, teach people, preach your word, you know. And yes, you're going to make mistakes, and yes, you're going to get slapped and criticized. And yes, but that's how we learn, and that's how we grow. But at least you are doing something. At least you are touching people's life. At least you are pouring out your life. And then you can say, I've poured out my life. I've done what I needed to do. I'm growing. I'm learning. That's when you come to the end of your time and you say, you know, my life has been poured out. And Paul says, you know, I've given my everything. He's sitting in prison. And he says, I don't know if I need to go on to be with the Lord because he's not sure if God is going to take him or whether he's going to stay. He says, it doesn't matter if I still live. For me to live is Christ. And then he says, but if I die, it is again. I will live with boldness. Live boldly. And therefore, you know, we looked at that verse. And remember, I told you in the beginning of this word where it says, go and tell. Go and tell. Jesus is risen. He's not here. Go and tell. Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is a power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. I am going to preach the gospel. I'm going to step up. I'm going to make disciples. Matthew 21, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So obey means loving God, loving people. We are going to raise our people for the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, we're going to raise our people with the word of reconciliation. We are going to, to conflict the ideas of the world, to conflict the violence and the abuse and the mutilation the devil brings on people's lives and people's bodies. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. And that's why we can say, oh death, where is your sting? See, God has not given us a spirit of fear. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of, uh, of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and fawning fear. But He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. We are not cowards. We will not be intimidated. Say with me, I'm not a coward. I will not be intimidated. See, we will not be intimidated. Not because we're doing it out of ourselves, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of the power of the living Jesus that is risen, that is staying on the inside of us. And He has not given us that spirit of fear. But say with me, I am calm. I'm well balanced. I'm disciplined with self-control. That is who I am. Say with me, I will not be intimidated. I will live my life with boldness. I will give my everything, leaving nothing, giving everything. Amen. That is why. That's the spirit that we have. The spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. That is what God has given us. Amen. Are you blessed this morning? So I'm closing off. If God is for you, who can be against you? Um, if God is for you, God is with you. The Bible says that he did not spare his own son, Romans 8.32, but delivered him up for us all. 
How shall he not with him also freely give us then all things? He has already given us Jesus. How shall he now not give us everything that we need? And he asked the question, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God to justify. So I'm not scared of the charges of the devil because death, where is your sting? He says, who is he who condemns? It, um, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, in other words, shall difficult and tough times. He says, or distress, or persecution, or famine. In other words, when I've got nothing, when I don't have a meal to eat, when I don't have food, will that separate me from the love of God? Or nakedness? In other words, when I'm exposed, when my weakness ex is exposed, is that going to separate me from the love of Christ? No. So even in my worst, and even in my weakness, and even in my peril or sword, he says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, say with me, persuaded, that neither death, no love, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no death, no any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is risen, He is risen, He is risen, He is risen. Hallelujah. Just there where you are. Come on, let's just come and apply this word in our life through prayer and make it our own. Let's just lift up our hands to the Lord as we pray unto Him and say, Thank you, Jesus. As you died on the cross, you conquered death. Death, where is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thank you, Lord, because we are children of God. We live in that victory. You, Jesus, you are you are our breakthrough. You're our victory and we live in you. And we thank you that by the blood of Jesus, we are redeemed from the power of the enemy. We are redeemed from death and destruction. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. And by your blood, Lord, as we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, we are fellowship with the saints and he cleanses us continually from all our sin we thank you by the blood of Jesus we are justified and God you see us as if we've never sinned and by the blood of Jesus we are set apart with this resurrection power inside of us to go out and to be that fountain that is overflowing to be that fountain that life to bring life everywhere we go and lord as the resurrection life of jesus is on the inside of us i pray father in our homes in our families in our workplace in our church our ministries let that life of jesus just flow through us and touch everyone that we come in contact with. We thank you, Lord. We praise you that you are alive. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that crushed the enemy is living inside of us. And thank you that we are more than conquerors, not in our own power, but in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we will live out this resurrection power within our life. Where we come, whatever we touch, whatever we do, Lord, that when we touch it, that the resurrection power will flow through and that we will see the work of God in and through our lives, which has been accomplished through Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you and we give you the glory for you are worthy to be praised and exalted. And thank you, Lord, for the rivers of life in our lives. We worship you. We are grateful. We praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you.